So my name is Malavika. You saw me on the previous panel. If you've had too much of me, look at Facebook or something. Uh, and I might be a little jet lagged. I've flown from Hong Kong, so excuse me. Um, so I thought I would tr start with something kind of controversial, just in terms of the title. It might be the only controversial thing I say. It might not be. Um, so I have done a lot of work in India, and I'm now based in Hong Kong, where I look after the whole region, running the Digital Asia Hub. And I constantly come up against this idea that privacy is a first world problem. It's something that you know we shouldn't export Western ideas. We should develop our own. And if it means that culturally we're not very private, it doesn't matter. Um, which is one thing if you're self-regulating and deciding your own norms. I think what makes it very, very problematic and the reason that's what I chose to focus this keynote on is when companies start doing that. The same companies that in other venues and in other contexts are very much about, oh, we can't comply with local laws because we need to have a consistent approach globally. Suddenly, when it comes to privacy, they're very, very happy to really, really care about what happens in local contexts and say, you know, the Chinese are not very culturally aware about privacy. Indians don't care. It's about families. It's about the collective. It's not about the individual. We shouldn't be exporting Judeo-Christian ideas and Western ideas of the individual being at the center of public life. Um, and so I find it very cynical when in those contexts, companies are very happy to say, oh, let's really worry about the end user and the individual when it allows them to actually adopt lower standards. So that's why I wanted to sort of flesh out some of that in this talk. So um, this is going crazy on its own. Anyway, um, so I wanted to throw out this quote and ask you where you think this comes from. Um, it's about allowing the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. Where do you think this comes from? Book, movie, document, law, whatever. What do you think this is about? Black Mirror? Uh-huh. Nope. Close, though. It's the kind of thing that should be in Black Mirror and probably is. Any other ideas? What does this sound like? Sorry? The Bible, Quran, no? Anything else? So this is actually from a policy document, believe it or not. Uh, it's probably the most creative policy document ever written. But it's about the Chinese social credit system. Are people familiar with the social credit system? Many of you are. Um, and it's the kind of thing that was making me very twitchy when Smitha earlier was talking about you know, a trust score. Um, it's this idea where citizens are being rated. And it's a system. So this is from the 2014 planning document. So it even predates you know, some of the creepiest Black Mirror episodes. And it's about how a social credit system is a very important part of a socialist market economy system. So look beyond that apparent oxymoron and move on. Socialist and market don't usually follow each other. Um, but it's about creating and establishing the idea of a sincerity culture, whatever that means, um, and carrying forward these va virtues and values. And it will forge a public opinion environment that trust keeping is not just necessary or useful, that it's glorious. And it warns that this new system will reward those who report acts of breach of trust. Right? So we're right back to the Stasi and to reporting on neighbors and to neighborhood watch schemes that you're actually incentivizing people to rat on their friends and neighbors. Um, and the reason I find this a little disturbing is, or very disturbing is the enormous scope. As with most technology projects, it's founded in hubris. It's founded on this idea that goes way beyond the idea of a mere credit rating system like with Experian and everything else. And it makes it about much more than the social. And I think it's this combination of credit rating plus social that actually is sort of credit rating on steroids um, that, that actually has a lot of very interesting implications. Um, and I should stop here to say that I don't want to just portray this scheme as something uniquely dystopian or particularly awful. It's actually sort of just the very extreme end of a trajectory that we've seen in Western democracies as well, of credit rating, of the reputation economy, of 
you know, rewarding and sharing ideas of what people can and can't do and are trustworthy. But I think this is kind of unique because like in a lot of emerging economies, it is seen as a very genuine response to a real problem. We don't have credit rating systems, enter a credit rating system or some solution that actually works with inadequacies in a particular ecosystem and says, well, we've never set up the systems that other countries do. What do we lack? It's going to be very, very hard for us to start from scratch when not everyone has credit cards, not everyone uses the same sort of systems. So, but everybody is on social media. Everyone has access to some kind of a phone. So why don't we actually tap into that network of data to actually assign people credit scores? And I think that's what makes it an interesting solution to a problem, but can also pose some really weird externalities. So some of the red flags is that it is a black box, like with most things today, um, where the algorithms are treated as trade secrets. It's also a pilot, so I should say that it's something that's being trialed across eight different companies, and once they sort of play with it and find out what works and doesn't, they'll then come up with the official version, um, which is supposed to happen in 2020. And there are government blacklists, right? You may have seen in the news everything from if you drink too much or cause you know, disturbance, you're not allowed to fly, right? They don't want you causing drunken episodes on a plane. Uh, or you're not allowed to travel outside the country because they don't want to embarrass the country, right? They want to maintain a certain reputation of law-going, law-abiding citizens. So it actually, there are blacklists for all kinds of things. Um, which are shared with private companies so that they can enforce it on the platforms. But it also begs the question of reciprocity. Like, uh, uh, can we give black, uh, blacklists where companies don't perform or where government fails us in certain ways? Um, and so it's a very unidirectional idea of trust. It's this idea that people have to keep proving to the system, and I use system at a very large sense, uh, keep proving that they're worthy of trust well, governments don't actually have to do very much, right? They just assume to always be acting in the interests of people. Um, they're closed systems, and when they're piloted across eight different schemes, it's a very internally generated idea of what counts for the algorithm, what gives, what, what is weighted in certain ways. And one of the things we do know from research that the Citizen Lab and others have done is that every one of these pilot schemes weights the data collected through their own platform higher. Therefore, incentivizing people to react and behave more on their platform to get higher credit scores. Um, there's a lack of context. So one of the examples is if someone, you know, you, you have a card for using on the underground, you use it twice in succession for you and for your little two-year-old who can't do it themselves. Uh, that to the system looks like fraud. It looks like you're trying to actually game the system completely devoid of context that this is a little kid that doesn't have the hand dexterity to actually move this on their own, right? So without the context, what looks like fraud might actually be something completely normal and benevolent and benign. Um, it's also this idea of gamification, right? You keep trying to game the system to get a high credit score, which is also kind of normalizing the whole thing and making it something playful, something within social media, not something we think we need to protest about or actually take a very uh, strong stand on. So there are five dimensions. I'm going to skip through this very, very quickly, but it's the usual things, you know, credit history, behavioral habits, um, the ability to pay off your debts. So if you can't pay off debts, you, you immediately rank very low. Personal information of all kinds, and your social network. So one of the most uh, apocryphal and the most touted ideas about the system is that it doesn't just judge your behavior, it judges the behavior of everyone you know. So if you are my friend on Facebook, I'm not on Facebook, let, let's assume I am. If you're my friend on any platform like Weibo, or WeChat, any of these, um, and you haven't paid off your student loans or your debts or you know, you're defaulting on something, you have uh, a legal order against you, my credit rating is going to be affected, even though my credit history, I, I paid off every single loan ever in my life, but you didn't, so my score is going to go down. So it's also this collective idea of trust and collective idea of we're all named and shamed and seen as one category. Um, so here are some criticisms that people have come up with. It looks at things like this, right? When it looks at behavior, things like if you play video games for 10 hours a day, you're probably not a trustworthy person. 
what if you're a white hat hacker who's playing all of these games towards knowing how cybersecurity breaches can take place? What if you're doing it to see how nudges can be used to get health information across so that people don't smoke, right? Again, devoid of context, just playing video games make, makes you look like a complete slacker and loser, but that could be your job, and maybe you're better paid than most bureaucrats in the government, right? Which is the case in most places now. And again, it's someone who buys diapers, is considered a parent, which you might not be, you might be buying it for a friend, and therefore you're more likely to be responsible. Parents are some of the most irresponsible people I've seen as, you know, you don't have sleep for days on end, you're gonna make really terrible decisions. But this system assumes that just because you bought diapers, whether it's for someone else, um, it's not clear, you're gonna be seen as more trustworthy. So again, the lack of context is troubling here. Um, and Sesame Credit, which is one of the um, ways in which it's being deployed, is very open about its links with the government and about how it shares all of the data gathered through its platform. And they actually have great pride in saying, here are all the acronyms and here are all the ministries that we work with. Um, and again, as I said, the new system creates incentives to report on people in many different ways. So moving from social credit, um, I wanted to also mention that this is not new, right? The Glass Room, which was an exhibition um, that the Tactical Technology Collective did in Berlin, New York, uh, and London, uh, created this really, really great set of artistic explorations of surveillance. And one of the products that they looked at was something called Lendo, which again is being targeted to emerging economies, to third world countries, whatever your term of art is. Again, which says, you don't have any credit score mechanism, so why don't we just exchange your browsing history to establish a credit score for you. My God, if people looked at my browsing history and gave me a credit score, I don't even want to think what that could be. You know, give the, what, is, what is the credit history of someone who's reading all about Kavanaugh and getting depressed, right? Um, so that's also sort of a very, very incomplete, imperfect way of determining whether someone should be eligible for something as life-shattering as a loan, right? It's something in enabling, empowering, if done right. Um, and so my worry with these kinds of systems, and I say these kinds because this is something that is proliferating. A lot of people are looking to this system, and while people in the West are saying, oh my God, so dystopian, so black mirror, so creepy, this would never happen here, uh, increasingly it's being replicated across Asia as people say, wow, what a great scheme. We're going to use it in our country too. And it's, not go it's only a matter of time before it starts creeping back into Western democracies, which might actually not be as resilient as we think they are. So when you move from social to social credit, which then results in social sorting, you're actually creating something really, really, really problematic. And when you think of the lack of contextual integrity, to use sort of Helen Nissenbaum's term, um, minus any kind of right to an explanation, never mind transparency, accountability, and all the other good things we've been discussing, or even consent, however contested the idea of consent might be, um, we might be in for something that's really paradigm shifting in Asia. Um, and here's one article about it, like what's, what's your public credit score? The government can tell you. And the reason this to me has a lot of resonance given my own work is it sounds exactly like what India is trying to do with its biometric ID project. This is many, many years old. These are posters that were found in the authority that actually ran the project, the Unique Identification Authority. And they might seem completely innocuous if you're not sensitized to privacy concerns or identity issues, but when you look at something like, who are you, we have the answer. Like, let, let us tell you who you are, right? Which also maps to Google's idea of we know you better than you know yourself which is true on a certain level. We have more data than you have about yourself, thanks to the fact that we never answer your subject access requests. We never give you the things you need. But this idea of like India knows you, but enroll for the recognition. We know you, you're fine, you're in the system, you're in the database, but just go and enroll and give us 10 fingerprints, two iris scans, your face, and all kinds of other demographic details, and then you will be legitimate in the eyes of the state. Um, but apparently the state also recognizes everything from dogs, which have managed to register for this, um, to the Lord Hanuman, our monkey god, beloved of many people in India. He's managed to get an ID card. Uh, Tommy Singh, another dog. 
trees have got, uh, you can't see it in that picture, but those are trees. And this is a whole catalog of errors, all the different ways that the ID card, which is supposed to be so foolproof, has been given to all kinds of things, to use Claudio's contested word, that actually don't deserve an ID card at all. Um, this is also the fate of a lot of data. We keep thinking of data as something necessarily digital, blue, shiny, in computers. But this is the reality of how a lot of data is collected, retained, destroyed, minus any GDPR obligations. This is what things look like in a lot of the world. Uh, it's not all neat and filed and categorized and keyworded and tagged somewhere. Um, and there was this sting many years ago, or a couple of years ago, and these were some of the ways in which people were trying to game the system. Um, these are actual, uh, this is a sting operation. These were the actual authorities responsible for registering people who were saying, well, we're going to make 100 genuine cards a day. So like, so what if we also make 10 fake ones, right? And charge people a huge premium for this. Because once this single ID card becomes your gateway to every single thing that you might want as a human being, welfare, hospital access, education, scholarships, loans, marriage certificates, death certificates. Um, you, 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 there is such a premium on getting it that if it hasn't come to town near you or you've had issues registering, there are long queues, people are willing to make you fake ones. And this actually gets into the whole point of the project was to prevent illegal immigrants and to give people welfare. But those are the very first people who are going to stand in line and say, give me a fake card because I need this so desperately to be here and to be recognized in the, in the, in the wording of that poster. Um, ideas of, you know, this is India. Everything is possible. Who cares? Uh, we'll just create more. It's election time. We need an ac access to extra income for our campaigns. Um, and this is like you're saying, you know, this is a great, like, we talk about the gig economy, talk about room service and home delivery. We'll just bring the machine to your house. It's portable. We'll register you at your own house, right? But what happens when you actually call out these abuses of power? Uh, the paper, Cobra Post, that actually did this sting operation and revealed very important information in the public interest, they got into trouble. So it was never about the data and the information that people needed in the public interest, let's just hang the people who've actually called out something as being the actual uh, problem. Um, Christo Wilson has talked about how something like a social credit system will spawn an entire black market um, and ways that people will game the system to actually boost their credit scores, just like people pay for likes, people can buy Twitter followers. It's the same way that uh, this will be gamed. And the more important you make that number, the more people are going to try and manipulate it. And this is something we're seeing across many schemes. Um, when you affix that kind of value to social information, it transcends the idea of what merely social is about. Um, we also have things about checking trolls by linking to this number. We think it's going to help keep the internet safe for work. It will take out hate speech, but it will take out anonymity. So as with most things, anonymity gets you know, thrown under the bus. So people who might never speak about certain issues are further silenced. Women might speak less. People of certain religious minorities may speak less um, about certain things online if they feel they have to publicly identify themselves and be linked to a number and can no longer hide behind anonymity, which protects so many other functions of a democracy. Um, this is, uh, any guesses for what this is? Some hints in the words there. So this was actually the pass that people were supposed to carry in South Africa, that foreigners were supposed to carry and identify themselves at all times. And it was this innocuous little piece of paper that Gandhi refused to carry. And he famously burnt them, saying that, you know, we're all one people. I shouldn't have to carry an ID card and other myself every single day. And it was this little minor act of civil disobedience in South Africa that turned him from Gandhi, just another lawyer, like all of you in this room and like me, into a civil rights activist. This is the moment at which the act of burning this card was the start of him working towards a very, very long trajectory that ultimately resulted in freedom for an entire country. So I wanted to show how identity, identity documents, and privacy and anonymity can actually be so meaningful that they can actually overturn entire countries and governments. 
Um, but unfortunately, that same country is now using rhetoric like this. And I say this for the entire Global South to stereotype a little, even though they might be quite blunt characterizations, because this is something I keep coming across in my work. Something is better than nothing, right? If we wait for a system to be perfect, we'll never get anywhere. With a population like ours, we start somewhere, and in a very Silicon Valley way, we tweak it as we go along. Everything is in beta testing. We'll work it out, right? Um, it's good enough for the developing world. It's good enough for poor people. They have no dignity. They have no privacy. So it's not like we're taking anything away. If anything, we're giving them access to something they didn't have. Um, or it's, you know, Indians don't care about privacy. Chinese don't. Turkish don't. Papua New Guineans don't. Whatever it is, you know, using culture as a way to actually excuse the conferment and the, you know, uh, enforcement of rights. And of course, the idea that even in the West we see all the time, but it's free, who cares? You're the product, never mind. I just want to you know, buy this very quickly and I'll click through any terms and conditions. Um, and that all of these are some first world person's idea of what the emerging world wants, right? Nobody asked them, would you like to have M-Pesa? Would you like to have microfinance? Do you think it's something you would have invented left to yourself without someone else being neoliberal and paternalistic about these things. Um, and ultimately, like with most areas of information asymmetry, mostly mediated by technology, the weakest, the poorest, the most illiterate, the ones least able to actually enforce and enact and actually you know, work with these systems and navigate their way towards them really delivering goods and services and benefits, they're the ones who, ha play, you know, who are bearing the highest burdens, the greatest risks through not knowing. You know, we don't even make informed choices. We have bounded rationality. Behavioral economics shows how you can nudge people into making really, really terrible risk assessments. Um, yet we expect that, oh, the user can decide. The user should consent. The user should click. Well, not all users are created equal, and not all users have the ability to actually self-regulate and protect their own rights. Um, so what are the challenges? In a lot of these projects, users are seen as the object of development. They are never seen as equal participants. They're never seen as people with agency, with ideas, with opinions. They're always the recipients of someone else's largesse, someone else's developing instinct, right? And you, I don't even want to mention all the different acronyms for different world organizations that try and develop people kicking and screaming against their own will. Um, so we all talk about access, we talk about inclusion, but it's usually someone else deciding what the rules of the game are and how you let other people play on terms that have already been set well in advance. Um, there are bottoms up grassroots efforts that people use that might actually work better for them as communities, as communities of practice, as culture. Um, but the, one of the issues people keep saying is, yeah, but do they scale? Maybe we need something bigger. But when the rest of the world is talking about how everything be being connected, per you know, pervasive, ubiquitous, centralized, is showing really, really bad cracks and dangers, should they even try to scale? You know, are they better off being small, ad hoc, informal ways of protecting privacy? Um, the trust paradox. This is just, I, I'm using this term, and it's because on one hand, if I find this very troubling and I'm trying to grapple through it, poor users don't trust government. They think the whole world is out to get them, and usually they're right, because in every way they've been let down by their elected officials, by systems, by technology, by everything that was supposed to help them, even their own taxes. Um, they don't actually help them. So they don't trust all of these systems, and they will game them in every way to try and find cracks and to hack their way out of systems that don't really work for them. But equally, in a very naive way, they can be very, very trusting because they don't understand these systems. They're in languages they're not familiar with. They're, they never learn to read. Or you have issues of ageism, like very, very old people in certain countries who don't know how to use technology at all, who are jabbing at things and making really poor decisions. Um, so they can be trusting. So maybe expecting them to bear the burden of you know, informational self-determination is, is really unrealistic. Maybe 
we actually push the burden onto governments and onto platforms to actually design things in a way that you're not leaving everything to the end user for them to actually regulate or even to think about why not have platforms that are in a much better position to enforce choices to actually create defaults that will protect users. Um, and you need it baked in at that level of the infrastructure and not at the level of the individual. So when we talk of privacy by design, ethics by design, I love the ideas of all of them as someone who has the benefits of privilege and education and being in the West. But I really, really worry that, you know, even when we think of trust by design, is it an idea that works? Do we expect people to actually implement it or do we need to do it in some way? Um, and to actually re-engineer the ways we think about it so that we don't think of these things, whether it's ethics or trust or all of these issues, we don't think of them as, oh God, what a compliance burden, or oh my God, this is so expensive, um, or it's a handout, it's something we're doing you know, as part of our corporate social responsibility because we've, you know, we've, we got away with not paying any taxes so we can give you a little bit of a handout. We have to think of something that is actually a competitive advantage that people will actually see as a way to innovate um, and not see as, as something that's coming in the way of development, coming in the way of innovation, um, or something that's just a compliance fix. So four very quick provocations and then I'll end, um, which are all like examples and pictures. Um, here's one idea from Manuel Beltran, and this was one of the exhibits in the Glassroom exhibition. He's created something tongue-in-cheek called the Institute of Human Obsolescence, and he's exploring the idea of data, the data that we all produce every single day, knowingly and unknowingly, as a form of labor and something that we should actually be given compensation for. So he talks about in this you know, AI-enabled universe where we talk about a universal basic income when people are automated out of jobs, uh, he talks about the idea of a data basic income, saying we're all producing and generating so many, many, many reams of data that is affecting the whole economy, affecting governments, allowing everybody to do what they do and get on with. We're not getting anything for it in a very tangible quid pro quo kind of way. So why not create something like a data basic income which begins to reward people for the data that they unconsciously produce every day just by merely existing. And he talks about this data production labor as uh, something that's already extractive and therefore it should be paid for. Uh, the other provocation is Emre and others talked about health, Claudio did, many people brought up health and again about gamifying and about how you know companies now give you Fitbits as a Christmas present or as a bonus. And a lot of people think, wow, that's so cool. My company gave me a new cool tech device that I can use. Uh, they're not really trying to give it to you for your own benefits. They're trying to do it so they can keep their insurance premiums down. So all of you who are so excited you got one, throw them away. Um, but this again is a wonderful artistic provocation by Surya Mattu, whose work I love where he created this idea of unfit bits, right? Where you can obfuscate the data and make it tell lies about you. Uh, so it's a, I'm not showing you the video, but it's a whole series of uh, in interventions to actually produce fantastic fitness data. Um, so it says free your fitness data from yourself. You might have terrible habits, doesn't matter, the data can be fabulous. Uh, and earn insurance discounts and all the other things we talked about. Um, so these are all kinds like of drills, gyroscopes, all kinds of things that will keep them in perpetual motion. So you don't need to actually walk those 10,000 steps or whatever target you set to maintain you know, good cardiac data. It's gonna keep doing it while you're lying on your couch eating potato chips and watching the latest Black Mirror episode. So it's, I love this line where it says, it provides simple techniques for generating great fitness data no matter what your lifestyle is. Right, so this is another way of people sort of gamifying and taking back control um, and messing with the ideas that systems and platforms think they're getting from you. Um, and in this idea, because I want to talk so much about the developing world, and uh, I wanted to introduce this, what, one of my favorite terms to you, which a friend of mine coined back in the day, which has now come into a few urban dictionaries, it's this idea of a cycle gap, and I think it works very well in Istanbul as well, given traffic congestion we've talked about. It's, you know, th this is sort of a very descriptive and poetic description. It's sort of 
about how when your second gear is down, you're trying to negotiate a pothole in a very badly paved road that your government hasn't fixed. Uh, there could be a flood, there could be a convoy of bikes. Everyone's trying to sort of find the little crack in a traffic jam. As you've seen here, you know, the bike will go across the pavement, then come onto the ground between a truck, holding onto the truck to go faster, all of the ways. So it says there's just daylight between the car and the parked SUV, which some yummy mummy dropped because she had to pick up her kid from school, or some guy thought, it's a Ferrari, why would I, you know, who cares? I, I own the road, I'll park it where I like. So as you're trying to cross, it's the exact width of a cycle to sneak through this congestion. And it's a metaphor in South Indian English for a very indigenous brand of opportunism. So before someone does a case study and then it gets written up in the Harvard Business Review and then gets given back to the world as lean innovation, but when we did it, it wasn't lean anything, it was survival, right? But it's sort of this cheeky kind of, you know, saying the system doesn't work, I'm discriminated, I'm screwed all the time, I'm gonna find my own way. Find, you know, it's sort of like in Le Leonard Cohen's song, like there's a crack in everything, it's how the light gets in, um, and that's that little window of opportunity. Um, so gamification and obfuscation as ways of empowerment and even revolution. Um, the third example, any idea what this is? Sorry? Sorry? About chewing gum, close? Close, close, close. Um, so this is in Hong Kong where I live, and these started proliferating on bus stops everywhere, and it was a very controversial campaign. So Hong Kong decided it wanted to tackle litter, right? There, were lit there was litter building up. They didn't really know how to sort of create a really strong public interest campaign to tell people you really shouldn't litter, it's a terrible thing. So this is allegedly faces that were reconstructed from the DNA found on the coffee cups that people threw away. So you have your sip of Starbucks or, you know, Lavazza or whatever your favorite thing is, you're about to throw it into the trash can, and a couple of people went around town and like were literally grabbing cups from people, like lipstick stains on the thing, whatever, saliva from all of these things, and said, we know who you are, don't litter, we have your faces, we reconstructed it from your DNA data. So of course this is nonsense, you can't actually do this, this accurately, but it was a very emotive, powerful way for people to say, maybe this is possible, maybe they do know who I am, and maybe I'll think twice before dropping the chewing gum under the theater seat or you know whatever. Um, so it turned out that it actually wasn't some you know, huge, um, creepy, privacy invasive performance, it was actually done with the consent of the people whose cups were used, um, and it was done by the Ogilvy Advertising Agency as a very, very sort of visceral um, way to get people to think about these things and say, well, maybe this technology isn't here today, but it's coming. Um, it could be a real thing. And as we've seen in China and elsewhere with you know, parking tickets being sent to people based on facial recognition, um, it's not that far off. And here's the reason why I think that's about naming and shaming people, and I wanted to come back to this idea of shame, because this is, you don't have to read all of this, but this is in an article about the Indian ID Project a few years ago by Graham Greenleaf, known to many people in this room, privacy expert and an institution all by himself, um, and Ursula Rao, about not, never mind the technology, never mind you know, the ways in which the data could be used, even the act of enrolling in a system is humiliating on so many levels and impacts different people in very, very problematic ways. This one is about dust. The whole idea of the project is to help the poorest and worst off who are not in any system and don't have any form of ID. But these are people who are manual laborers, who are itinerant workers, who move around the country. They have decades worth of dust from being laborers. Their fingerprints are what in the trade to a biometrics expert are poor quality fingerprints, right? So they keep rubbing at them, they're giving you tissues, they're giving you Kleenex, they're trying to wipe them, and they keep, you know, this is the whole sort of way, he, they, they document the sort of humiliation of your own body being found inadequate and wanting in the eyes of a device that's trying to capture it, right? It's like the system's constantly telling the human, you're not fit for purpose, you don't meet our criteria, your standards, yep, they don't fit. 
Uh, people have scars, they have severed fingers, mutilated hands. It's only recently that we're talking about getting rid of polio. Uh, people have industrial accidents, yet we're trying to fix them, grasp them very literally and make them uh, part of the system. So this was very yeah. humiliating for people. But the second one is for women who are, again, as with a lot of technology which are encoded with biases, um, they were, there was a very different problem because a lot of them, especially the shy ones from you know, less urban areas, they're not you, they kept lowering their gaze and people kept saying, look up, we can't actually capture your irises. And they're not used to looking someone straight in the face. They're not lo used to looking at another man who is not their husband directly and making eye contact. So they're either behind veils they're hiding, they're feeling shy, they're feeling humiliated. So they had to go find an unmarried person to come and help them. They had to find someone related to them, a woman who's literally holding their chin up, saying, it's OK, you can look up. The device can't be capturing your eyes otherwise. Um, so they're crying because of the effort and the stress of keeping their eyes open. Tissues are being given by these people. Um, so the whole system is. You know, the, it's supposed to be empowering you, but you've started out feeling somehow like you're not good enough for these systems. So, but yet they're so imperfect. So, are we moving from the panoptic sort, which you know surveillance studies scholars talk about, to a panoptic sort of? It works. It doesn't. It works for some people. It doesn't work for others. Some people will be discriminated. Some people will bear the you know heaviest brunt of it. But do we care because it's helping them? So some of the patterns that I want to end with, the technologies of surveillance that keep getting normalized in different ways, when you combine them with social problems that are very endemic in the rest of the world, they result in what I think of as a welfare industrial complex. It's not about the military. It's not about entertainment. It's about very, very basic needs. And Maslow's human rights hierarchy is how I think of it. You know, if if we don't have basic food, clothing, shelter, education, who cares about privacy and security? Like, I don't even have what it takes to survive. These are optional things. These are luxuries. And even in the West, we're seeing how privacy is becoming a luxury, where, oh, that's, you know, there's a, that's a premium. You need to pay extra for that. Even Sheryl Sandberg said, oh, there is no privacy option in Facebook. Like, you need to pay for that. That's a premium product. Uh, security theater is alive and well in Asia. None of these things work, but we think that people will somehow believe that they work, that the CCTV cameras will actually capture things. They don't actually capture people being abused or people raped. That we don't care about actually using the tools to do, but they will record all kinds of other creepy things that are not actually useful. But the, here's the biggest problem I face. If you critique this sort of solutionism effort, which is you know Morozov's famous word, um, or, or, you know, you're bucking this techno-utopian narrative about how technology is the savior. You're the Luddite. You're anti-progress. You're somehow holding your country back. You want to curb innovation. You're business unfriendly. It's never about protecting the rights of people who are depending on you as their proxy for speaking for them. Um, you're the one who's actually retarding progress while they sell the country away. Um, and a law or a policy vacuum, when you don't have data protection laws, when you don't have strong consumer protection, or you have all of these things beautifully written on the books and zero enforcement on the ground, um, they can amplify these negative externalities of even the best projects. Even when they're architected well, even when they're designed well, they're still going to fail. Um, so we keep thinking of data as the new gold, the new oil, the new all kinds of things. Maybe we need to reframe, especially for developing economies. It's a ticking time bomb. It's like an asbestos. You know, get it out quickly before it kills you. Is it kryptonite? Does it have a half-life? Should it be like, you know, disposed of very quickly before it starts becoming radioactive? So this idea of the second you place a premium and say data is such a valuable commodity or resource, even cynically, as I mentioned earlier about people, we're data and therefore we're up for sale. Um, that's a really troubling development. So I think the more we sort of buck these idiotic ideas and metaphors about data being all kinds of amazing things, uh, the quicker we begin to realize the limitations uh, in our daily lives. So what's needed? Better data, better research. And if you're not following Research, Mark, research Wahlberg on Twitter, 
Please change that immediately. Every joke about statistics and data that you ever wanted using Mark Wahlberg memes, it's absolutely fantastic. So we really need to move away from like big data is the new AI, is the new neuro, is the new blockchain, is the new everything. Um, look at ways to tackle the black box, whether it's actually opening it up, which might not work, recognizing the limits of transparency, um, whether it's looking at proxies, whether it's improving input and output data, um, all kinds of interesting things are coming out now with learning or actually using techniques of AI that don't rely so heavily on data where like in AlphaGo Zero, it actually learned by playing against itself rather than by watching every single game ever played and learning from the data. Maybe that way lies more reliability, less bias, less worries about representation. So maybe, you know, s s focus more on those areas of research. And finally, don't forget that a lot of this is about being human. Any idea what this is? So this was a slide someone from Sony showed at an AI event we did in Tokyo. This is a funeral for the Sony Ibo dog. You'll see these are rows and rows of decommissioned, defunct, destroyed, uh, clapped out dogs. And because people were so attached to them as pets, this is a Shinto ceremony actually conducting a funeral for all these dogs that were no longer supported by Sony. So this idea that data is disembodied somewhere else, the technology is never something that has effect, um, this really drove home to me that ultimately it is also about emotional relationships uh, and bonds. It's not just about something that is you know, a ticket to something else. It's not just an enabler. It can have value uh, in itself and never to forget that. And some of you may know of the suicide of someone called Rohit Vemula, a college student in Hyderabad. And this was in his suicide note uh, when he talked about how identity politics made him kill himself. You know, he was from the Dalit, from the lower caste, um, and he kept coming up against obstacles. And he said the value of a man was reduced to his immediate identity and nearest possibility, right? to a vote, to a number, to a thing, and never was a man treated as a mind, as a glorious thing made up of stardust. And I think we lose sight of that, that in all of the you know, interventions, services, products that we keep, we forget something extremely essential about what it means to be human that can't be grasped, that's something as intangible as stardust. So I would urge you all in whatever you're doing, which is all very worthwhile, to find that little piece of stardust in what you're doing. Thank you. In the interest of time to catch up with the schedule, I offer to not do Q&A now and to move it to the coffee break. So if you have questions, please just come and talk to me then and uh, welcome your next panel. Thank you.